Uh, let's look at Ephesians chapter 2 this morning. We're going to be reading verses 11 through 22. And I really believe that this is its really the heart of the book of Ephesians. I think Paul has been building really to this point and this message in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 22. This is the word of God. I'll read it out loud. Paul writes, Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made by the flesh, by the hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who are once far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he may create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace. And might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to those who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens... But you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Let's pray together. Lord God, uh, we thank you and how good it is when the people of God dwell together in peace and unity by the cross of Christ. You have made us one, Lord, and we thank you for that. And God, we pray that in this message now, your spirit would be among us, that it would work inside of us to see the unity that we have in Jesus, the great forgiveness that we have in Jesus, and the great gospel of grace would capture our hearts and would capture our minds to be your people in a fallen, broken, and sinful world. And we pray this all in the name of Jesus, by the power of the Spirit, and all God's people said, amen. Well, uh, my kids uh, have recently, uh, or just this past summer, they were reading a lot of books that I put on their book list. And um, one of the books that I put on my son Eli's book list was The Watsons Go to Birmingham. This is one of my favorite books as a kid. If you don't know the story, it takes place uh, over 60 years ago. It's the story of the Watson family, who's an African-American family. They lived in Flint, Michigan. But they decided in 1963 to go and spend the summer down in Birmingham, Alabama. And it's actually a work of historical fiction because it's recounting true events. And it all surrounds the true events that happened in Birmingham in 1963 on September 15th. This is a day in history when four men, all of whom of these four men were local members of a Birmingham chapter of the United Clans of America, a group that met at the Anglo-Saxons Club in Tuscaloosa, just miles away. These men planted 19 sticks of dynamite under a staircase at 16th Street Baptist Church. This is one of the first black churches. It's still around today. It was one of the first black churches organized in Birmingham following the institution of segregation. If you know the story, at around 10 a.m., a man called the church office. This was a Sunday morning at around 10 a.m., and the secretary, her name was Carolyn Mall, she answered the phone. And she recalls that the man on the other uh, side of the phone, on the other end of the line, just said two words, answered and said, three minutes. And then, three minutes later, 19 sticks of dynamite were detonated, taking the lives of four innocent African-American girls, one named Addie Mae Collins, 
The other, Cynthia Wesley, Carol Robertson, and Carol Denise McNair. Innocent girls who were just at the church practicing in the choir, practicing to sing later that night at the youth evening service. And it's interesting, uh, earlier that year in 1963, George Wallace, he had just been elected governor of Alabama. He delivered his inaugural address, and it was a strident inaugural address. In his speech, he said, quote, Today I have stood where once Jefferson Davis stood and took an oath to my people. It is very appropriate then that from this place, this very heart of the great Anglo-Saxon Southland, that today we sound the drum for freedom. In the name of the greatest people that have ever trod this earth, I draw the line in the dust and I say in Alabama, segregation today, segregation tomorrow, and segregation forever. It is hard to believe. Those are things that happened just 60 years ago. Only 60 years ago, it was commonplace to see blacks over here segregated from whites over there, eating in separate sections of a restaurant, using separate bathrooms, going to separate schools, and even tragically attending separate churches. Whites over here, blacks sit over there. Only 60 years ago, advocating segregation today, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. Yet really, that was the landscape in 62 AD in Ephesus. Paul, who's the author of this letter, we've spent some time looking at this. He was writing in 62 AD, and he was writing to the churches in and around Ephesus. And what we've seen is that at that time, many of those churches, they were embroiled in division, divided between church and state, divisions between Christians and pagans, di division between ethnic Jews on the one hand and ethnic Gentiles on the other hand, but especially there was division within many churches throughout Ephesus and throughout the Greco-Roman world, especially between Jewish Christians and then Jewish uh, or Gentile Christians. And these were causing internal divisions within the church. On the one hand, you had these Jewish Christians. These were men and women who had grown up in Jewish households, but they had come to believe in Jesus as the Christ, the Messiah, the promised Old Testament king. And they came from this culture and this religion that was Jewish in background. And then on the other hand, you had Gentile Christians. These were people who also believed that Jesus was the Christ, that he was the king, that he was the promised Messiah of the Old Testament. But they came from a culture and a religion that had its background in paganism. And this division in many churches was commonplace. It was just part of the landscape of uh, religious life in the first century AD. So much so that if you were to travel back in time, just imagine you were to travel back to 62 and you were to ask a Jewish Christian walking on the street, hey, is is Jesus, is his kingdom, his, his church on earth, his kingdom on earth, is Jesus' church for Gentiles as well as Jews? For many, many of Jesus' earliest followers, even some of his apostles to begin with, their first inclination, their first thought to that question would have been, ah, no. No, I don't, I don't think so. No, no, the promises are for Jews, not for Gentiles. That would have been their first answer. I don't think so. No, the church is not for Gentiles and Jews. Because Jewish Christians, you see, they, they would have thought, because they, they knew their Old Testament, they would have thought, God chose Abraham. Around the time of Abraham, 2,000 years before Paul was writing, the world was corrupt. It was, it was polluted. If you think the world seems corrupt and polluted now, just go read the book of Genesis. Right? You will see there, there's stories of death, revenge, polygamy, idolatry, warfare, betrayal, kidnapping, incest, prostitution, slave trading. Just about every kind of pollution and corruption you can imagine, uh, it was going on back then. And so out of this polluted, corrupted mass of humanity, God graciously chose Abraham. 
By grace, he separated Abraham from the world around him. And through Abraham, God made this promise to the Jewish people, through the Jewish people, that one day he would send his Christ, that one day through this Christ, through this king, he would bring his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. And so when you look back at the Old Testament in books like Leviticus, for instance, God established this litany of ceremonial laws and commandments and ordinances, all to remind the Jewish people, you are different, you are distinct, you are separated from the world around you. So there were laws that required Jews to observe holy days or certain ceremonial feast days. If you read Leviticus 23, there's feast day after feast day. There's the Passover, there's the Feast of First Fruits, there's the Feast of Weeks, there's the Feast of Trumpets, there's the Day of Atonement. And then there's the Feast of Booths. There were also ceremonial ordinances that dictated how you treat rashes and wounds and diseases and bodily discharges. Some people were to be considered clean and others who had diseases like leprosy or rashes that were persistent, they were considered unclean. And then there were commandments and laws that regulated diet. Some laws and some laws said that some animals are unclean. Those are foods that you do not eat. Pigs, vultures, lobster, and anything with blood. And then other animals were considered clean. Fish, lamb, etc. Those are clean. Those are fine to eat. All of these ceremonial laws, they were meant to illustrate, you're my people of promise. I chose Abraham. I chose the Jewish people, Israel, to be a separate people. Through you, my Christ will come. But as time progressed, this mentality developed, a mentality of superiority, where Jewish people began to think, oh, we need to be separated, not just from things, not just from foods, not just from rashes, not just from certain bodily discharges. We need to be separated from people, those people out there, they're polluted. They are the problem. We need to avoid them. They're not descendants of Abraham. Those people are far off from God and they need to remain that way. And so this separation, it was even reinforced by the temple, God's holy temple where he promised to dwell with his people in his land, with his holy people, the Jews to remain separate. What they did is they erected this large stone wall in the temple court called the dividing wall of hostility. And that wall separated Jews over here, polluted Gentiles out there. And there was this sign on the wall. It actually got discovered about 200 years ago through uh, archaeological excavations. And they found one of these signs that was on the dividing wall of hostility. It said, quote, no Gentile may enter within the barrier and enclosure around the temple. Anyone who is caught doing so will only have himself to blame for his ensuing death. That was just part and parcel of the religious landscape in the first century A.D. So much so, if you asked many Jewish Christians, hey, is Jesus' kingdom on earth, the church, is it for Gentiles as well as Jews? They would have said, no, I don't think so. There are Jews over here, people of God's covenant promise to Abraham, and there are polluted Gentiles out there. It was commonplace, not altogether different from segregation today, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. But in verse 11, Paul says that that separation, that division, all of that belongs to the past. Paul addresses Gentile Christians specifically here, verse 11 and he says to these Gentile Christians, therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles, the Greek word is ethnos, you ethnos in the flesh called the uncircumcision. And just pause here for a moment. What does that mean? What is ethno, or sorry, what does the uncircumcision mean? Well, it means that God graciously chose Abraham. He gave this sign of circumcision, and circumcision was a sign of God's covenant promise. It even became part of Old Testament law in Leviticus chapter 12, verse 3. But like many things, this circumcision, it became a mark of superiority. It came a way to say, hey, we are better than you. 
So much so to be called the uncircumcision became a term of derision. Like terms of derision that we have today, right? We have these. We say, oh, that lib over there. Or that snowflake. Right? Or that person who's woke, childless cat lady over there. Or any, any <laughs> you know, any phobia or phoba, right? That's a transphobe. That's an Islamophobe. That's a homophobe. Well, I just disagree with you. No, you're a fascist. You're a fascist. You're one of those MAGA people. You're a threat to democracy. You're a science denier. You're a Husker fan. <laughs> I'm a Husker fan, all right? Stop it. <laughs> it's a way of labeling someone way out there, right? They're, not, they're in left field. They're, they're not even in left field. They're in the left field bleachers. They might not even be in the left field bleachers. They're in the parking lot their way out there. So to be called the uncircumcision, it was a derogatory term. It was a term to say that person is worthless and way out there. And we over here, we're superior. And Paul says, verse 11, Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles, ethnos in the flesh, called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, that's the Jews, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. That's how things used to be. Jews, circumcision over here, Gentiles, ethnos, uncircumcision out there. We Jews over here, Israel, we have God's promises. He promised to send the Christ, the Messiah, the King to us, the King who will bring eternal peace. He's going to forgive our sins. He's going to be a temple sacrifice to forgive our sins, his promise to bring his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven, to bring a world without death, without idolatry, without oppression, warfare, slavery, all of that, a world without sin. We have God's promises to Abraham, Moses, David. They belong to us. And then there's the Gentiles out there. They're strangers, aliens, hostile toward God, having no hope and without God in the world. And realize for, for thousands of years, thousands and thousands of years, if a person didn't know the God who, who dwelt in the temple, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and, and Jacob, if a person didn't know the promises God gave to send his Messiah, if a person didn't embrace those sacrifices in the temple by faith, and if a person was alienated from the Jewish people in the Old Testament, in other words, if you were a Gentile, you had no hope, and you were without God. And now, sure, a person, a person could come, the, theoretically, and this, often, or this sometimes did happen, a person could come from a Gentile background, and they could become a Jew. They could be circumcised, observe the ceremonial laws, follow the ceremonial commandments of Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy and Exodus, and then they could be forgiven, then they could be saved. But by and large, to be a Gentile for thousands and thousands of years B.C., the time during the Old Testament, if you were a Gentile, you had no hope and you were without God in the world, you could not be saved. And to be sure, the same is true today, too. There's a parallel. It's been true for thousands of years A.D. since Christ. The promised one has come. Today, if a person doesn't know Christ, the one to whom all the ceremonies and sacrifices pointed to, if a person doesn't know Christ as their Savior, then that person does not have hope, and they are without God in the world. Islam does not save a person. Hinduism cannot wash away a person's sins. Buddhism gives no assurance of eternal life and peace with God. Buddhism doesn't even really believe in God. Morality, generally conceived, being a good person, it cannot remove death, injustice, oppression, and sin from our world. Vague and general spirituality does not make a person holy and will never bring God's kingdom of peace on earth as it is in heaven. Only Christ can do that. Therefore, if you are apart from Christ, you have no hope and will be without God in this world and the world to come eternally. Something many people don't realize. But here's where the problem arises. It happened then, 
And it happens today in Christian circles, even though God has saved people by his grace, chosen a people to be separate by grace, not because they're morally superior, not because they're better than others, not because they make good choices, even though God has saved us strictly by grace, chosen us and separated us, it is possible to develop this mentality that everyone outside, everyone out there, they are polluted, they are clean. We need to avoid those kind of people, those who are far off, black people, we need to be separated from them. Latinos, they're the problem. We need to be separated from them. In fact, they need to assimilate to us first. Conservatives, they're radical. Libs, they're ruining the country. Jews, we're superior. Ethnos, they are the uncircumcision. They are unclean. They are polluted. But notice what Paul does here. Notice this. Paul says that that separation, that division, that belongs to the past. Do you see that? Paul writes exclusively in the past tense here. Look at verse 11. He says, remember that at one time, at one time in the past, you are called circumcision. Verse 12, again, past tense. Remember that you were separated, alienated, and strangers to God's promises. That's how things used to be. Jews. Those of us who are clean over here, Gentiles, uncircumcision, out there, pollution, out there. Paul says that has changed. That belongs to the past. Look in verse 13. He then shifts to the present tense. Still addressing Gentiles, he says, but now, but now in Christ, now in Christ Jesus, you who are once far off have been brought near to the, by the blood of Jesus Christ. You see, this is temple language here, isn't it? To be far off or brought near, blood of Christ. You remember in the Old Testament, to be forgiven of sins, a person had to come one day a year on the Day of Atonement. They had to bring a sacrificial lamb. It had to be a spotless, perfect sacrificial lamb. And they would bring it to the priest. They would confess their sins over this sacrificial lamb. They would slit the throat of this lamb. They would shed its blood. And then the priest would take that blood and he would sprinkle it on the inner sanctuary at the mercy seat of God. It was a way of saying the blood of the lamb by his sacrifice, my sins have been removed from me. They have been uh, judged in my place. And now by the blood of the lamb, I am forgiven and brought near to almighty God. But now Paul says here in 30 AD, when Jesus was crucified, his death was the temple sacrifice, the sacrifice of atonement. Like the sacrifice of a spotless lamb of God, shedding his blood, shedding his blood as a sacrifice for our sins to bring us near to God. But Paul's main point is in verse 14. Can I get an amen really quick? But then in verse 14, Paul actually drives at a much more central point that he's trying to make throughout Ephesians. Look at verse 14. Paul says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and is broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances so that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who are near. For through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. Do you see what Paul is saying? Not only does Christ's sacrifice bring us near to God, amen? But we also are now one with one another in Christ Jesus. Verse 14, the dividing wall of hostility in the temple, 
The wall that separates Jew and Gentile, it has been broken down by what? The flesh of Christ. Verse 15. The ceremonial commandments and laws and ordinances, those dietary laws, right? The ceremonial feast days, the circumcision of the flesh, the clean and unclean distinction, all of that. All those ceremonial laws meant to separate Jews and Gentiles. Those laws have been abolished by what? Jesus' perfect sacrifice. All the hostility between Jews and Gentiles now. Verse 16, Christ has killed that hostility and has reconciled both Jew and Gentile in his one body through the cross. Or as Paul says, Galatians chapter 3, verses 28 and 29, he says, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. That's Paul's main point. Ask Paul. Is Jesus church for Gentiles as well as Jews? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Jews and Gentiles in Christ are children of Abraham. It's not about race. It's about grace. Regardless of your race, the two have now been made one. There are not separate promises for Jews over here and Gentiles over here. In Christ, all the promises of God given to Abraham belong to one people, the one people of the church united to Jesus Christ. Those things that once divided you, those things that once separated you, those things that once put... Jews over here, Gentiles out there, two people, they have been abolished. They have been killed. They have been broken down by the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. We have been brought near to God, and now we have been brought near to one another, one in Christ, because in Christ Jesus, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are one in Christ Jesus. Yes, yes, yes. Jesus' kingdom, his church, is for all kinds of people without question. Make no mistake about it. Don't misunderstand Paul's point there here. This is important. Paul's not saying, and I've already made this point, but it bears repeating. He's not saying that there's no separation whatsoever. He's not advocating for some you know, watered down ecumenism that says, hey, every person is saved regardless of what they believe. Jesus died for every person, whether you believe in him or not. No, no, no. There is still a separation. For example, if a person doesn't believe Jesus is the Christ, that he's their king in life, their only hope of eternal life, their God, their Lord, their spotless sacrificial lamb, their savior from sin and eternal damnation by shedding his blood on the cross as a sacrifice of atonement in 30 AD, their almighty resurrected savior who gives them eternal peace and forgiveness with God. If a person does not believe those things, they are like the Gentiles of old. They are still separated, alienated, strangers to God's promises, having no hope and without God in the world. But insofar as a person calls Jesus their Savior and Lord, the only true God and sacrifice for sins, whether they be Jew or Gentile, Republican or Democrat, capitalist or socialist, black, white, Latino, Pan-American, Native American, or whatever label you want to put on it, insofar as a person confesses Christ, they have been brought near to God, and now we are one in Christ. Deer Creek, there are so many controversies in our culture today. And these are non-eternal controversies. These are controversies that divide and separate the one body of Christ. Four years ago, churches divided. They, they divided and separated over whether you were a masker or an anti-masker. People left churches and fellowships because they said, I am tired of wearing masks. Four years ago, churches divided over whether you were a vaxxer or anti-vaxxer. 
For the last 40, 50, 60 years, churches have separated over controversies never commanded by God. I can understand why Jews and Gentiles would maybe divide because some of those things were commanded in the Old Testament, but now we're dividing over things that aren't even commanded. Alcohol or no alcohol? Immersion baptism or sprinkling or pouring? Well, the church won't practice my way of doing it, so I'm going to start my own church and I'm going to do it my way. Dating or courting, black church, white church. I guarantee churches this election season in 2024, they'll split over this candidate or that candidate. They'll separate over this party or that party. My church won't put out voter guides and allow the church to have registration for voting outside because they just lack courage. Friends, it takes no courage to put out a voter guide that agrees with every point that you have politically. It takes no courage. And don't hear me wrong. I'm not saying those things are unimportant. I'm not. I'm not saying that. Nor am I saying that all political ideas and positions are equal, by the way. Absolutely not. Political positions that advocate for abortion or same-sex marriage, unfettered greed or ruthless treatment of marginalized people, they are sinful. But please hear me. Hear what I am saying. I'm saying that if our political positions, our political ideology, if our views on secondary issues of schooling and modes of baptism, and if our views on vaccines force us to separate ourselves from Christ's one body, if our views force us to develop a mentality that says we liberals over here are so much superior to those conservatives out there, if our views force us to view the whole world as if every person on that side of the aisle is wrong and we are right, contrary to all evidence, by the way, if our views drive us to that point, then we are ripping apart the unity and the oneness that Christ earned by the cross, the oneness he earned by shedding his blood as our atoning sacrifice. By the sacrifice of Christ on the cross, we have been brought near to God, but we are also now one in Christ. Friends, if God accepts anti-vaxxers by faith in his son, Jesus Christ, how can we divide or separate ourselves, even within our own churches, as if they are not one of us? If God accepts a person who votes for Kamala Harris or Donald Trump, if he still accepts them by faith in his son, Jesus Christ, how can we divide and separate ourselves from them as if they're not one of us? You see, to do that is to rip apart the unity and the oneness in Christ that he earned by his shed blood on the cross, the blood that was meant to draw us near, to not make us two, but one. As cross-centered Christians, as cross-centered Christians, how can that be? To do that is to go back in time. That's to go back prior to 30 AD and to re-erect unbiblical walls of hostility. And it is antithetical to the cross, the flesh, and the blood of Jesus. Paul put it so well in his letter to the Romans. He said, may the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. For Paul, this is not a question. Those things that divided you and separated you, those things have been broken down, abolished, killed by the shed blood of Christ on the cross. You are now one in Christ Jesus. And to reinforce that point, that you are one in Christ, Paul says something remarkable in verse 19. Verse 19, Paul says, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but your fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. 
In him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Again, this is temple language. When Solomon built his first temple, this was back in 950 AD, the temple was reinforced, that, that, that reinforced the separation between Jew and Gentile. What Solomon did is he laid the foundation, he erected pillars and walls of the house, and he built the inner sanctuary where God was going to come and dwell. And then something remarkable happened. After he had erected this new temple and prayed, set apart the temple for God's people, something remarkable happened. As soon as Solomon finished his prayer, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. And the priests could not enter the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord filled the Lord's house. When all the people of Israel saw the fire coming down and the glory of the Lord in the temple... They bowed down with their faces to the ground on the pavement and worshiped and gave thanks to the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. When Solomon built the first temple, God's glory, his spirit, descended. It filled the temple. God dwelt with his people in the temple. The God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob lived in the temple among his people. But again, in 30 AD, all of that changed. Paul says... This is how things used to be. But verse 20, Paul says there is a new foundation. Verse 20, the foundation is the apostles of the New Testament post 30 AD and the prophets of the Old Testament prior to 30 AD. And this foundation is completed with Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. He's the one uniting old and new. In verse 21, on this new foundation solidified by Jesus, Jew and Gentile are being joined together into a new holy temple in the Lord. Then verse 22, they are united together, one in Christ Jesus through his cross. Jew and Gentile together are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. The temple is in the past. The temple that reinforced the separation, that's past tense. But now in Christ Jesus, the temple is the church, the church united as one, the church of Jews and Gentiles, blacks, whites, conservatives, and liberals. The church is now the holy temple in the Lord, the dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Those things of the past have been broken down, abolished, killed, and you are now one in Christ. Amen. Amen. Billy Graham, a uh, famous preacher. He was preaching one of uh, his revival sermons in Jackson, Mississippi in 1952. And during the heat of segregation, right, he was tasked with preaching to a mixed audience. It's one of the first times that Billy Graham was going to be preaching in the South and he was going to be preaching before blacks and whites. And before the sermon, he noticed in this venue where there was bleacher seating going up from his pulpit, from his stage, he noticed going up into this bleacher seating, there was this red rope that was literally dividing the entire uh, bleacher section. And so he asked what this red rope was, and he was told, oh, that's the red rope that separates colored section over here, white section over here. And so Billy Graham, this is about 20, 30 minutes before the sermon, proceeded to walk into the crowd where people were already gathered and going up step by step by step, he's taking down this red rope and removing it from the stadium seating. And so for the first time in nearly 100 years in Jackson, Mississippi, post-Civil War, once segregation had been established, whites and blacks worshipped God together. He was asked after, why did you do that? And he said for him it was simple. He said the closer people of all races get to, the cry, to Christ and his cross, the closer they get to one another. For Paul, this is not a question. 
those things that once separated you no longer ought to separate you. The church is now the holy temple of God, the dwelling place of God, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, and in him there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is no longer slave nor free, male nor female, for you are one in Christ Jesus. Make no mistake, when Jesus fully and finally brings his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven, when his church is complete, we know exactly what that church will look like. Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. John says, after this I looked and behold, he sees the church complete, a great multitude that no one could number. From every nation, nation there is translated from the Greek word ethnos, from every ethnos, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the atoning sacrificial lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches of peace in their hands and crying out with one loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the lamb. Amen. The communion meal is not just, we're told in the Bible, a communion meal that helps us remember Jesus' sacrifice. It does do that. But Paul also says that this bread that we share is one common loaf because Jew and Gentile, all the things that separate us on an earthly plane, they all are done away with and we now have one unity in the flesh of Christ his flesh has broken down the dividing wall of hostility. And likewise, his blood was shed. His blood was shed so that we might be one in Christ Jesus as we have been brought near to God. As Billy Graham said, for the closer people get to Christ and his cross, the closer they get to one another. So Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he was gathered with his disciples. He broke bread, gave it to them and said, take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. And in like manner, after they had finished eating, Jesus took the cup. And Jesus said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Not like the covenant with ceremonial sacrifices and feasts and ordinances. That's been done away with. But this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Shed for the remission of all your sins. And he said, for as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim his death that unites us to God and unites us to one another until he comes again. And on that day, all tribes, all tongues, all nations, the church will be complete as one. Friends, Jesus invites you to come and taste a foretaste of what that day will be like. That's what this meal is. It's a reminder we have been brought near by the blood of Christ. We are also one with one another, a new family of God, members of the household of God. We belong to one another. And so if you believe in Jesus as your only salvation from sin, and if you believe you belong to the church of Almighty God, to come, take, eat. Jesus wants to minister to you through this meal and remind us of the bond of unity and the spirit of peace we have with one another. If that's not you this morning, then join the body of Christ. Join his body. Place your faith in Jesus and you will have a new family that loves you, that will embrace you and you will have a common home, the eternal kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven.